Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Throughout this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone there. Now, in today's episode, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with Edmonton Councillor Ashley Salvador. But before we do that, I want to take a moment and ask you... If you're a supporter of municipal issues from across Canada, hit that follow button, hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to this or watching this. Stay up to date on all our latest interviews and our special episodes of the Municipal Affairs and the Political Trenches Local Government Network. Now, on to our interview. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, before we get started, I have a question that I've opened all my interviews with. So you're no exception to this question. And I think it's the most important question that gets to the crux of the entire interview. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Ashley? Mm, that's an excellent question. And actually one that I've thought long and hard about, um, and even more so since I've been elected. So uh, for me, I've always been quite active at the municipal level. So prior to being elected, I uh, actually did a lot of advocacy to the previous city council. I have a background in urban planning and actually founded a nonprofit organization here in Edmonton about, about eight years ago now uh, that advocated for policy and zoning reform to allow for more diverse housing types, uh, more affordable housing types, more uh, age-friendly housing options in our neighborhoods. And through that work, I realized how important it is to be able to um, enhance civic literacy, to be able to uh, be involved in the political process. And for me, I was always drawn to the municipal level of government because it is the closest level of government to the people. It is tangible. It is um, the things you feel and experience when you step outside your door. Uh, so I was always very passionate about that. And, um, you know, I have some fantastic mentors um, and, and folks who uh, have been involved in this realm for a while. And they're like, hey, you should, you should consider running. Um, so I thought, okay, maybe I've done, <laughs> done enough advocacy and yelling on the other side of the table to previous council. Maybe, maybe I should try being on the other side. Uh, so yeah, put, put my hand up and ran a, a pretty bold campaign uh, and enough people got behind me and decided, hey, let's give it, let's give it a shot. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to start with young Ashley, if we can, for a second. And I want to know, was politics discussed growing up at the dinner table? And if so, was it federal, provincial, or was it municipal, which you ended up going into? You know, it's interesting. I would say politics wasn't necessarily discussed in the... Uh, technical sense or jurisdictional sense, if you will. Um, but there were many long conversations uh, really about values and about some of the systemic challenges that we were facing um, in our cities, in our communities, particularly around um, issues like, like homelessness. Um, I remember, um, so I, some context, uh, I was actually a commuter kid. So my family had a farm about an hour east of Edmonton but all of my schooling was in the city. Uh, my grandparents were in the city. So I had kind of a dual, dual life, if you will. And, you know, during those one hour commutes uh, each way with my mom, we'd have some, some pretty deep conversations about, you know, like why, why are there folks who are living rough in our city? Like what, what happened to, to lead them to a place where they, they're living rough and, and sleeping in our river valley? Um, so I think from that perspective, I had political conversations very early on and started to understand the systemic failings of, of all levels of government uh, when it comes to serving vulnerable community members. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, and I apologize, um, but you, you first put your name forward in the 2021 municipal election in Alberta. Had you consider it prior to 2021? Because you talk in your opening statement about uh, how you, someone sort of said, put up or shut up and put your name forward and why, why, why not do it? Had you consider it prior to 2021 or was 2021 the moment when you said, okay, now it's Ashley's time? Uh, I had not considered it prior to. Um, and I should also, some important context, um, I was 27 when when I decided to run for council, so a relatively young young Edmontonian. Um, and up to that point, I mean, I was going through university, getting my master's degree, had just started this nonprofit, which was uh, quite successful. Um, so it wasn't necessarily on my radar 
in, in a big way. Uh, but looking around at where the city of Edmonton was in 2021 and, and where we are right now, I thought it was a unique opportunity to be involved in the implementation of a lot of fantastic strategies. So the way I describe it, uh, past councils did some really excellent work teeing up strategies, um, policies, things like uh, the city plan, which is our municipal development plan. It creates a fantastic vision for our city, a beautiful vision, looks great on paper, but now we actually have to do it. <laughs> and oftentimes, um, what I've seen is we can have beautiful visions on paper, but if we don't have the courage to take the steps to actually implement it, that's where it falls short. Um, so I'm very much a doer. Like I, I like, um, I guess the grittiness that comes with making those really tough decisions that say, oh, this, there are trade-offs that we're going to have to deal with if we want to achieve um, the beautiful vision that we've set our, set for ourselves. So um, from that perspective, beyond city plan, I mean, we have a fantastic climate strategy that was teed up, uh, zoning bylaw renewal that was teed up, bike implementation plan that was teed up. So I wanted to be doing that that implementation work too. So we're going to talk about some of the issues in a few minutes here, but I want to stick on the role of counselor. And I want to pick up on something that you've said previously, but now You've been in this position now for two, almost two years, well, over two years now, because we're in November, but is it what you expected? So for someone who had been advocating to City Hall and being on that side of the table and now being on the other side of the table where you're listening to those who are advocating for uh, their issues that are important to them, was it what you expected? Because you, you are now in the position and the boots of someone who you were advocating to. Was it what you expected when two years into your mandate now? A great question. Um, in many ways, yes. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, I'm still learning every single day in this role. Uh, I always feel very privileged to have to have had a planning background in particular. Uh, so much of the work that we do around the council table is related to land use uh, and land use planning. So being able to come in with that understanding and um, that knowledge really, really helped. So from that perspective, yeah, definitely what I expected. Um, I, I love that part of my role. Uh, some of the things that, that have been maybe a little unexpected or um, things that you don't quite know until you're really in the thick of it, uh, some of the um, you know inter intergovernmental challenges and conversations, and uh, just how how dependent uh, cities can be on other orders of government when it comes to solving the issues that we collectively need to solve. You you've been two years, and I keep on saying two years because that's a major milestone for a lot of new term, first term councillors because you're halfway through your mandate now, and. One of the big things that I find when I speak to municipal leaders from across Canada is something you've said a few times, and that's the civic literacy part. There's a there's a misunderstanding of what the municipality's role and responsibilities are and what they play in the day to day life. But, you know, as someone who has had the background, sorry, my dogs are barking right now. <laughs> For someone who has the background, who was engaged in the municipal world prior to putting their name forward, are you finding that there is a misunderstanding on what the jurisdictional role the municipality plays? And when people approach you, they may be talking to you about provincial issues or federal issues, or are they understanding? And is there a literacy or an understanding of the civic literacy of what role you play in the democratic process? Mm. You know, we, we, we ask the tough questions on this show. No, it's a great question. And, and I mean, it's something that I have always been passionate about. I think um, when you empower people with that knowledge and understanding, um, they're able to, to take part in, in that democratic process. And I would say for the most part, um, I think folks have a fairly good handle on on the role of the city and, and more so on those front facing sort of core services uh, that they expect to see on a daily basis. Um, I would say it gets a little more complex when we start talking about, um, about issues and challenges and opportunities that cut across jurisdictions. And, and obviously I, uh, I mentioned earlier, 
um, when it comes to affordable housing and, and the homelessness crisis that we're currently experiencing, as well as mental health crisis, opioid crisis, uh, because we see those challenges playing out on, on our streets on a daily basis, um, people look to the municipality, right? Like they they look to their councillors and oftentimes that's because their councillors are, are very accessible. Um, so I think in that sense, there's, there's not always clarity as to who exactly is responsible, um, but it's, I mean, it's a collective responsibility. So I think that's totally fair that uh, Edmontonians are plugging into their council as that first place, but um, always really important to say, hey, thank you so much for your advocacy. Uh, let's push together to ensure that all orders of government are pushing in the same direction on these issues that matter to you. Is it hard, though? Because I can imagine while you have issues like homelessness and mental health and addiction and the opioid crisis that are affecting all levels of government, while it does impact the municipalities more because you're the local level of government, is it hard to say we need to work together? Because when people come to you, I'm assuming you probably have figured this out in two years, that you you they want to hear from you because they're not approaching their MLA, they're not approaching their MP, they're approaching you for a reason because they think that you have the best chance of getting something done or working with the other MLAs or their mm -hmm. MPs. So is it hard to understand that people are approaching you without the understanding that maybe it is a all level of government, all hands on deck approach to these issues that you're talking about, because you have a better chance of hearing back from your MLA or your MP mm -hmm. than they might as an average citizen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yes, it can be challenging. Uh, but at the same time, um, it always... <sighs> It actually gives me hope that people are coming to me with with that compassionate lens, with that that caring lens, and wanting to see action. Right? I mean, that that to me um, is a good thing. And I always feel quite lucky in the ward that I represent, Ward Métis. Um, it's it crosses over with uh, an MLA and an MP who are incredibly engaged um, in in community as well, and we have a really excellent relationship. I mean, we just. Just this past week, we had um, a barbecue, didn't you? Or oh, drop it? Yeah, we had we had a barbecue in the summer, and then uh, we had an open house where all three levels of government uh, come together and just give Edmontonians an opportunity to connect. And um, those opportunities, in particular, I think, are excellent for civic literacy because people will come to me with certain issues, and I'll say, "Hey, this is how the municipality can help, but you need to go to talk go talk to uh, your federal rep or your provincial rep about these aspects of it." Um, so those bridging opportunities have been just remarkable here in Board Métis, um, and people really appreciate being able to have access to all three levels uh, in, in one room. Okay, you've mentioned the ward, so I've got to ask this question, because you are elected as a ward councillor in the ward of Métis in the city of Edmonton. But when you're sworn in, you are not sworn in as a ward councillor, you're sworn in as an Edmonton councillor. And the role is to look at the entire city as a whole, but without forgetting about the individuals who have elected you of your ward. Have you found that balance to be sort of hard to understand that every issue is an Edmonton issue, but you have to bring a perspective of the ward. And sometimes you're voting on things that may may not impact your wards as it may impact someone else's wards, like Councillor Tang's ward or Councillor Knack's ward. So is there, have you found that balance of making sure that your ward residents feel like they're being heard and their issues are being addressed, but you're there to advocate for the entire city and not just the ward? Yeah, yeah, it's a great, great point. And absolutely, that first responsibility is to the entirety of the city of Edmonton. Um, and oftentimes the way I think about it, uh, if if we're making decisions that are good for the entirety of the city and for the whole, uh, they're going to be good for residents in Ward Métis as well, for the most part. Um, and uh, Ward Métis is, is fantastic. It's so unique. Uh, so we, uh, we're a ward that's composed solely of mature neighborhoods. Um, so there, there are no new communities and no, no new build out in Ward Métis. Um, and that comes with some unique challenges and opportunities. Um, but, you know, one of the common threads that, that really touches, I would say, uh, all wards in the city of Edmonton is around the revitalization of, of our communities and ensuring that uh, all neighborhoods have access to uh, good amenities to be able to live a good life in our city, uh, good transit, those, those core things that make a city function. Um, and I really use that as my guiding light and my backbone.
I so I did a deep dive on your social media prior to this interview, and I traditionally don't do a lot of research on my inter- <laughs> guests because I want to learn. But you mentioned something that I it, it, I have to ask. You are very passionate about transit in your in in the in in Edmonton as a whole. Why is that such a big uh, passion of yours to mm. advocate for more transit, but affordable transit as well in your community? So many reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'll start from from an equity perspective. I mean. I'll be I'll be blunt, like the city of Edmonton, historically for the last few decades, uh, has been a city that is oriented around personal automobiles, um, and that has created a number of challenges uh, from from an equity and inclusion perspective. Quite frankly, not everyone can afford to own a vehicle, um, and we want everybody, regardless of how how they get around, uh, to be able to access great amenities to be able to meet their their basic needs uh, relatively close to home. And um, if we don't provide viable alternatives to car ownership, um, you can create situations where Edmontonians are isolated. And uh, I often think about uh, seniors in particular uh, who maybe drove it at one point of their lives, but no longer have that option. So being able to invest in public transit uh, ensures that they can stay connected to their communities and can live a healthy lifestyle. So that's that's a big part of it. Um, I would also say from a climate lens, it's critical. Uh, two of the biggest drivers of climate change are land use and transportation. And those two are intertwined. Uh, but but on the transit front, I mean, the more folks we can, we can get uh, out of vehicles by providing that viable alternative, uh, the better it is going to be for our climate. Um, and I'd also say from, from an economic development perspective, transit can really be the backbone uh, to drive investment into our communities and, and a driver of um, support for local businesses. Here in Ward Métis, we just had the long-awaited Valley Line Southeast open up um, and to see people joyfully riding that line, um, to talk with business owners who, who can't wait to see the new traffic, uh, hopping off the LRT to visit their business, it's, it's just transformative. Um, so yeah, transit, transit is the backbone when it comes to climate resilience, um, equity and inclusion, uh, and economic development for, for our cities. So, so to play a little bit of devil's advocate, is it hard to balance that though? Because some people are not going to be stuck in their ways and just want to stay in their cars for the rest of their lives because that's what they that's their preferential mm-hmm. uh, uh, mode of uh, transportation. But you're right, transportation is needed, particularly accessible transportation in the forms of uh, uh, trains, buses, you name it. Have you seen an uptick in the last two years as a counselor where people are more turning to those modes of transportation to sort of address some of the challenges you've just laid out, climate uh, challenges, transportation, economic challenges, because people can't afford cars right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so just to your to your first point there, um, ultimately, it's about choice, right? We want people to have options for how they get around their city. Um, and... I often think that, you know, if we're striving for for transportation freedom, everyone should be able to get around in ways that work for them. Uh, you're not really free if you're forced to own a car to be able to meet your basic needs. Um, and of course, there will always be folks who drive and and that's fine. Um, it's a pro- about providing those alternatives for folks who, who can't or choose not to. Um, and then when it comes to, to seeing that uptick, um, well, we have a very ambitious goal at the city of Edmonton to see about 50%. You certainly do. <laughs> of 50% of trips made by public or active modes as we work towards a population of 2 million. Um, so I don't have the exact data in front of me, uh, but we, we do get annual updates for, for how that progress is coming along. But are um, you but hearing I've... from residents saying that they're they're more willing to take now the, the new train yes. that just opened up because it is a another option for them and it's a viable option for them now absolutely so i was one of those uh those people who got on the train at five in the morning uh, because i had to make the first ride Uh, and i i stuck around for a few hours i was there till the afternoon and i was actually just going around and talking to people on the train and listening to their stories and i heard from so many folks who shared that this is going to change the way they get around um people who live next to the line or who moved ne- next to the line to be able to commute to downtown um, if they had previously driven. Like 
there you go. Um, even individuals who live uh, the far extent of the line over in Mill Woods, uh, seniors in particular who shared with me that they hadn't visited downtown in a decade. And now they get to go with their friends wow. and grab a coffee in our downtown. Um, so absolutely, uh, from what I'm hearing from constituents, uh, the line has already been an incredible addition to, to those neighborhoods. I have one last question in this subject before we turn to the city as a whole. And I, I want to, because it's been coming up a lot lately in my conversations, I want to talk about the role of engagement as a counselor. Because you you openly talked about the uh, barbecues and the coffees that you've had with the MLA and MP, but um, those are people who are engaged. Those are people who want to come out and ask you their, uh, offer their opinion. How much engagement do you do to ensure that you're hearing from all residents, not just the ones who are in the, the social echo chamber that you have, whether it be social media, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, or sorry, X, Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> but you're hearing from people who may even disagree with you because your job is to hear from all perspectives, not just those who agree with you. Is it hard to engage with people outside of your echo, the sort of the social media chambers that we have and go and listen to people who may just disagree with you from time to time because that's part of your role. Yeah, and I think those are the conversations that can be um, oftentimes the most illuminating. And uh, of course, one of the ways that that I have those conversations is to door knock, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes ex expecting- The simplest, simplest way is always the best in my opinion. <laughs> Um, expecting folks to sort of come to you at, at various events. That's a very, yeah, an important part of being able to engage with constituents, but um, actually going out to them and meeting them where they're at is really critical. Uh, and of course, there's various ways that I engage as an individual counselor, uh, but I would also say as a Will people city. stop you at the town, at like at the grocery store and uh, offer their opinions <laughs> on issues? <laughs> Um, I've had that happen once or twice, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but you were talking about the city. Yes, the so as as a whole, when I think about the engagement that uh, city administration does for a lot of our larger scale projects, I think about zoning bylaw renewal. I think about uh, the engagement that went into the city plan. I've always been impressed with uh, the way that engagement has evolved at the city, and I'll use the city plan as an example, um, strategically going out to locations where you're gonna meet folks who typically are not engaged in city building, um, going out to like the basketball court um, to chat with, with younger Edmontonians to talk about what kind of city do you wanna see? What do you wanna see in your neighborhood? I think those are really rich um, and, and valuable opportunities. And I'm so proud that those are the types of tactics that, that we've been taking as a city or even doing pop-up style. Um, again, meeting, meeting people where they're at uh, and not, not expecting them to be experts necessarily on subject matter in order to engage in that process. Do you find you bring a different perspective to council than your fellow colleagues? Because you are the youngest, if I'm not mistaken, on the Edmonton City Council. So you're representing sort of a generation that traditionally doesn't get involved in municipal government. They usually don't even get involved in politics. Do you find yourself sort of looking at issues through the lens of sort of the 25 to 34 year olds right now when these issues are being brought forward? Or do you have to look at all issues, not through the lens of a newer generation, but from an all generational standpoint? Um, a bit of both. So, okay. I mean, absolutely. Every, every counselor around the table is... Uh, coming with their own lived experiences, uh, their own expertise, their their own um, values, and from that perspective, absolutely. I mean, I I am a younger Edmontonian, um, and I think that inherently shapes my perspectives on certain issues. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, ran ran a very bold campaign that was openly talking on every door about public transit, about housing affordability, about climate change, about active transportation. I was very upfront about that. Um, and yeah, from that sense, I think I bring a unique perspective at the same time. Um, in this role, it's so important to be able to 
to be empathetic and, and really um, expand your, your lens uh, to, to understand where other folks are coming from. So uh, a bit of both. Understandable. I want to turn to my next segment because I'm cautious of time and I know you're a busy counselor. So I want to talk about the city as a whole now. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying the same thing I do all the time from this question. And that is, this is the conversation between Chris and the counselor. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion. I don't know why, but we still get emails about this from time to time. Here we are in 2023. Counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this interview, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing your city today? So I will go with issues, plural. Um, <laughs> Shocker, said the host who's right? done this about a hundred times. <laughs> so um, one of the primary issues that is on my mind every single day, and I know is on the minds of constituents, uh, every single day is the compounding crisis of unsheltered homelessness, the opioid crisis, as well as um, the mental health crisis that we're experience experiencing right now. And I mean, that remains a uh, top priority for, for me. Um, and I know that it's a priority for, uh, for council colleagues as well. Um, and again, it gets, it gets very challenging because as a municipality, I mean, we're investing heavily into supportive housing where it's not just about a roof over someone's head. It's about having 24 seven wraparound supports uh, for folks to be able to tap into. Uh, but again, we need desperately need supports from other orders of government to be able to tackle an issue as systemic as this one. Um, we were making progress prior to the pandemic, uh, but when the pandemic hit, uh, we really slid backwards. We saw the number of um, houseless folks double in our city. So that is top of mind. Absolutely. I would also so say... Can I can I ask the million dollar question on that? Because I think this is a, a, a topic that needs to be discussed a little bit more in depth before you talk about a few other issues here. What do you do in the short term? Because this is not, this is a multifaceted approach that yep. you have to take here. The province needs to come to the table. The federal government needs the, to come to the table. And the other part that we often forget to talk about, but residents need to come to the table because this needs to be at all hands on deck. So what does Edmonton and your role as counselor do in the short term to mm -hmm. sort of address some of these unsheltered, unhome, uh, homelessness uh, population that Edmonton is seeing? Yeah, absolutely. So there's um, sort of the the systemic issues that we know we need to tackle in the long run, uh, but there's also incredible urgency when it comes to House of Edmontonians, and uh, even more so as the weather's been cooling off and we head into winter, and and that urgent need is shelter space. I mean, we know that of course shelters are are not a long term systemic solution, but given the past few winters where we've uh, seen folks losing limbs who are sleeping rough in our city, it's just, it's unacceptable and it's, tra it's tragic. Uh, so that immediate need for shelter space is critical. And we've been doing a lot of advocacy uh, around that and, and hopeful and optimistic that um, our provincial partners come through on that front. Uh, I would also say from, from the city's perspective, we have been allocating significant funding towards supportive housing in particular, um, and, and also being able to leverage federal dollars uh, as we look to build out those projects. So really, really trying to work across the housing spectrum from um, shelters to bridge housing, supportive housing, uh, all the way up to uh, market rate affordability, right? And, and that's more on the, you know, we can toggle things like zoning. We just went through a big zoning bylaw renewal. Um, we, can, we can look at subsidized housing as well. So it's about taking a holistic approach and some of those are going to be um, more effective in the immediate short term. Some are going to take a while. I want to get back to some of the issues because I apologize for interrupting there, but I think that was an important question to ask when we're talking about this, because it's always great to talk about the issues, but it's always great, even better to talk about what we're doing to address these issues in the short term. So I want to jump back into the original statement of what are, you've talked about unsheltered homeless people, the opioid crisis, what other issues are facing your community right now? Yeah, I would um, shift gears a little bit and, and, say one of the big issues that we're facing is financial viability of our city. <laughs> um, and and when, I, when I say that, I'm coming at that from a, a land use perspective, a growth perspective, an infrastructure perspective. Uh, city of Edmonton, like many 
prairie cities uh, grew quite fast in an outward manner. Um, and of course, there's a cost to that form of growth. Um, and, and the cost comes in the form of, uh, of new infrastructure, but also in the form of renewal. And right now, we have about a half a billion dollar infrastructure deficit annually uh, between our ideal infrastructure renewal investment and what we're able to, um, to put into renewal. And as a councillor that represents solely mature neighborhoods that were built out in the 50s and 60s, uh, I mean, we've seen schools close, we've seen um, the loss of amenities, questions around the sustainability of rec centers, uh, because we, we don't have the capacity to fully um, revitalize and, and uh, maintain those assets. So that is something that is top of mind for me. And as someone with an urban planning background, um, it really comes down to the cost of outward growth, right? Like there are uh, efficient ways to grow as a city and- oh, So I was sorry. gonna say, so you, yeah. you, uh, you, you just brought up a, uh, outward growth is what was happening in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And that's where yes. people were going. Now in 2023, we're looking at densification. We're looking at a sprawl. We're looking at potentially even instead of growing out, grow up because exactly. that's the only way we can grow because most municipalities are at the limits. As someone with an urban planning background, is that viable in your t your ward where you are seeing those traditional 50s, 60s houses where the larger lots, sort of larger sort of... Uh, I, I don't want to say module houses because they aren't because some communities don't have that look and feel, but are you seeing more diversification and densification compared to sort of the sprawl that we have seen in the past decades? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say um, incrementally, we we have started to see a lot more infill development and uh, growing in and up instead of out. I would say city of Edmonton for the past probably 10 years or so, uh, has taken a concerted approach to shift the way that we grow uh, because we recognize that financially it's just not sustainable for us to grow in an outward pattern um, continually. And from an environmental perspective, we're also eating into prime agricultural land at our fringes. Um, and yeah, I would say we're starting to see more housing diversity. Uh, we still have a long way to go though. And when it comes to the types of infill that we've been seeing in Ward Métis and other mature neighborhoods, uh, usually we're seeing a 50 foot lot split into two with two, uh, we call them skinny homes or narrow lot homes being built. Uh, and that's one form of infill. But I always say there are many other types of infill uh, that I think would be fantastic for some of these mature neighborhoods. Um, oftentimes the narrow lot homes can be quite pricey and, and that works for some folks, but if we're striving for more affordable housing, uh, we need to we need to look beyond skinnies. So looking at things like duplexes, row housing, um, mixed use as well uh, in strategic locations, looking at uh, courtyard housing is a, always a great example where you have a cluster of smaller bungalows around a central courtyard, really excellent for aging in place, but also really good for younger families who are looking to get into some of these mature neighborhoods. Uh, and through the zoning bylaw renewal that council just uh, moved forward with, I'm really excited for the opportunities that that's going to open up uh, when it comes to housing diversity uh, as well as affordability and, and attainable housing um i am very cautious of time here and i know you're a busy counselor so i have to sort of keep us moving here but i i feel like i could just sit here for another half hour just talking about infill and zoning <laughs> permits with you because i feel like this would be a great conversation but i i, I want to i sort of have to ask the sort of the mirror question on the issues because i've been accused on the show of only talking about issues that municipalities are facing but what does edmonton do right what does Edmonton get right? When you go to Alberta municipalities, when you go to, to speak with ed municipal leaders from across Canada, what do you say that Edmonton is doing right when it get, comes to the governance and politics of uh, municipal governance? Mm, many things, but you're, you're talking to an Edmonton advocate and booster here. like, I, Well, boost uh, Edmonton <laughs> as much as possible for the next two minutes there. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so many things. Um, Maybe I'll just stick on the planning train for one second. Uh, Edmonton, I always say, is an unassuming leader when it comes to forward thinking planning reform. 
not only has Edmonton just recently taken a huge step forward with our zoning bylaw renewal, um, but we've been we've been taking strides for years. We were one of the first major um, Canadian municipalities to eliminate parking minimums citywide. Uh, we've already eliminated single family only zoning. Um, so progressively over over a matter of years, we've been making um, really bold decisions. And I think other cities are starting to take note, uh, which is fantastic. So that's on the planning side of things. Uh, and I also have to say Edmonton has, has maintained its competitive advantage when it comes to housing affordability and livability. And in part, I think we've retained some of that affordability because of the planning moves that we've been making. Um, it's also, I always say it's a city where you can be a young person, you can have a really good idea, you can actually run with it and, and be taken seriously. I've, I've lived in a few cities uh, across the country and Edmonton is a city where you can be, you can be gritty and you can sort of plant a flag and plant an idea and surround yourself with other passionate folks who, who will help you do something with it. Um, and I think that's uniquely Edmonton. So we have a real entrepreneurial spirit here that I, I love talking about whenever I can. Um, I will just throw a shameless plug in for Edmonton, even though speaking as a Calgarian right now, um, my neighbor, my neighbors who just left, I moved in five years ago, they were there for 60 years, they left Calgary and they moved to Ward Métis just recently because they found a cheaper house closer to their family, well to their kids and their grandchildren. So there you go. There's the shameless plug Perfect. for Edmonton Ward Métis <laughs> for a second. Tell them to reach out. <laughs> there you go. I want to, I want to turn to my last segment and it's a very important segment for myself because i enjoy it and that is tourism i think tourism does Ooh. not get enough mention in municipal governance and i want to change that so as a counselor as a representative for edmonton but also for the representative for the ward of metis what are the great tourist spots in your community in your ward specifically that you boast about and you tell people if you come to edmonton you have to come see this this building this monument whatever what are the tourist yeah. gem, gems in metis oh my gosh there are so <laughs> many um okay let me do like some rapid fire um so I'll start with festivals because there are, Edmonton as a whole has amazing festivals, but in Ward Métis, uh, we have Folk Fest. Um, we have amazing winter festivals as well. So over in the Alberta Avenue area, uh, there's Deep Freeze. There's also a uh, Kaleido Fest. Um, we have the French Quarter over in the Bonnie Dune area in Ward Métis. Uh, the Flying Canoe Festival in the winter is an experience like no other. Um, they race canoes down the ski hill. If you've never been, you got to check it out. It is such a fun time. Um, and there, there are a number of other festivals. I would say when it comes to attractions, uh, the Matart is here in Ward Métis as well, uh, which is a fantastic time. Um, always learn new things when I go there. And you can now take the Valley Line Southeast to the Matart um, and to Folk Fest. And that would be my, my additional tourist attractions. Ride the train. Like that's genu genuinely what I've been telling folks. Um, it is a beautiful ride. You have fantastic views of the downtown uh, as you're coming down Connors Road. Um, and it's also just a great way to, to see various points in Ward Métis. Um, yeah, there's a few other hyper local ones. I mean, Borden Park is one of my favorite parks in the city. There's some beautiful public art, interactive public art um, in Borden Park as well. The River Valley itself, uh, I think is, is an incredible tourist attraction um, and, and something that we don't talk about enough. Uh, I think that we need to be yelling from the rooftops that we have uh, an incredible gem that runs right through the heart of our city. I could keep on going, but- I know, <laughs> and I have cost some time here. So I, I want to ask my million dollar question on this show. And it's the one that I think every municipal leader knows how to answer, but it's always great to hear them answer it on the record. So that way it's ingrained in history. What makes Edmonton such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? <laughs> I mean, I alluded to this before, but... Um, Edmonton is a place where you can put down roots, where you can start a business, where you can have an idea and where you can really make a go of it. Um, and part of that is because of our housing affordability. Um, 
But I think a part of that is also because of the spirit of Edmontonians. Um, like I mentioned, we're we are gritty, we're entrepreneurial, uh, we're builders and we're doers here in the city of Edmonton. Um, and I think that's really unique and I think it's really special. Ashley, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview. I know we ran a little bit late, but I do apologize for that. But I do appreciate this and I appreciate you serving your community. I don't think municipal leaders hear that enough, but I want to change that. So thank you for stepping up and thank you for serving your community and making your community a better place for people to live, work and raise a family. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape communities from across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our show. As we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. If you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. We couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can continue to deliver the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.